that, that countdown timer is unbelievable. I felt like um, well, it was Keith Sutherland. I thought I was in the, in the 24 show. I didn't, I didn't ever watch the 24 show. What am I doing? Take a seat. Oh, just there, just, so just take a load off. Woo! before we pepper you with questions. So just a reminder, everyone, this session is interactive. So if you'd like to sl uh, slide in some questions on oh, okay. Slido, you can sl scan right. the back of your um, lanyard and hit, hit us with some questions. I'm going to kick off, though, Brooke, and I would love to know, what's it like working with Keanu? It's pretty amazing. We, um, it came out of the blue. Like I said, we had the craziest week last year when these things released and were announced, and we had, like, back-to-back -back Zooms, and at about seven o'clock one night. Um, I had this Zoom scheduled, no info, and so the people came on, two lovely ladies, and um, I said, I'm so sorry, I don't know what this Zoom is about, don't have a, you know, can you just give me, you know, a cliff notes, like, pitch meeting? And she said, well, Keanu and I really love what you guys are doing, and the rest was like an amazing kind of story where that was Alexander Grant, his incredible wife, um, and over the course of the next nine months, we talked about what would be important if we've got this opportunity, what would be important and how we could affect real change mm. with it? Mm. Well, my head is spinning a little bit from all the topics you covered in that, in that talk. Yeah, maybe not 52 slides next time, eh? Maybe not, but <laughs> look, let's work with that. I love it. I think um, one thing I'd love to, to kind of start um, by talking about would be a point that Zoe raised earlier um, in the education segment. She was talking about technology reflecting its makers mm -hmm. and... And I think that it's an interesting challenge to what you're hoping to do at Futureverse around an inclusive and kind of indigenous first um, space for people. How do you think about that idea that maybe there are some stereotypes about who is building Web3, what they look like, their sort of, you oh, know, yeah. their backgrounds? Like, how do you get across? I mean, the that? first thing is if you go to any crypto conferences, like we, we mm. sit so far outside the bounds of that. We have a heavily female um, community. Uh, we, we make all of our spaces as friendly as possible, as inclusive as possible, because the problem with cryptocurrency and the culture right now is it's not inclusive. That's the challenge. Um, so without defining who we are, the first thing we're trying to do, actually, Alexandra has this wonderful um, metaphor where at universities in the States, they build all of the buildings, and then they kind of just leave it unpaved and they leave grass out there and you can see where everyone's kind of walking mm. and that's how they build the pathways. And so for <laughs> us, that's the way that we've been approaching this, just trying to get as many people from as many cultures involved and then see what comes from that, how they start to shape Web3. Because again, us going in there and trying to say, this is how it's going to happen is just more of the same, right? And you talked about an aha moment, which is, which is a really interesting way of putting it. Um, if you think about people who aren't Web3 literate or crypto yes. literate, what are some of the like aha use cases that you think will, will kind of have people create those pathways? I kind of, I, I alluded to something that was really interesting there. So, you know how I bought that fluff? Well, um, a, a collective called the Hume Collective bought a fluff um, in August, called it Angel Baby, and now have uh, four of the top 10 NFT songs with this, with this, this character okay. that they're using. They're telling their stories. Um, they raised $11 million on a $78 million valuation two months ago because they're reimagining the way that music is brought to people. And that sense that you can build these communities and then people in sub-communities can feed off of this and co-create is pretty awesome. Mm. Did I answer that? I just went on a little tangent there. Yeah, no, I like it. So <laughs> people might be into music first and then it, it turns out they have an NFT experience or they have a Web3 experience to access their, the music they yeah, love. Yeah, I mean, that's... <laughs> Just like the internet, Web3, like, like Web1 and Web2, Web3 will move through every single industry. Mm. So whatever passion you have, if it's music, it's already happening. You know, Kanye selling, I think it was Kanye selling 11,000 songs and making the same amount of money as he does with 220 million plays mm. on Spotify, right? So a sense that most musicians now are realizing it's a much better way to reach their audiences and fund their music. But music... Um, Media tend to be first movers. Interestingly, in this one, banking, like DeFi is definitely reshaping the way that banking's happening. Um, communications, we've got, I don't know if you saw the little robots that float around next to you in the metaverse, they're called Seekers. And those are an incredible company. Who here knows about Silo? Kiwi company Silo, amazing company. And they um, have this really interesting product, decentralized communications, it's amazing. And five years in, they've been building their network, mainly um, tech 
focus mm -hmm. and people were kind of connecting into it, but it wasn't until they released 47,900 seekers, they got 7,000 new users, they built this cool um, story that kind of overlaid their technology and now people are starting to figure out how they can access that community and be a part of it. Mm. So we've got a question in from the slider, which I think is interesting on this point as well. Okay. It's how can NFTs solve our basic problems? So how do, you, how do normal people get value out of this space, this technology? We've got two girls in Nigeria who um, are great artists and they've connected into our community and they're selling their art into our community, a connection that has changed their, not just their lives, but their entire families lives, the sense of being able to connect. It's so easy for someone in one of these cultures, um, especially in, in, in the center of creative arts, to connect to an audience and for it to change mm. life. So there are clear ways that cryptocurrency, NFTs, blockchain will be solving some you know, fundamental challenges. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah it, 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 it's, there's a broad spectrum, mm. simple stuff and some complex stuff as well. Yeah, I like, you've touched a lot on sort of the creator proposition. Because yes. it allows you to well, directly access your audience, to monetize your audience without the middleman, and maybe well, reach a global community. Here's the thing, community. Is there are creative people all over the world in every culture um, creating amazing art. And so, you know, teaching them how to be a part of the Web2 world, learning coding or whatever, you know, upskilling them, like, that's quite a big, that's a big chunk to, to tear off. But if instead you're teaching them how to simply connect their art to a network, and then monetize that. That's a much shorter journey, mm -hmm. right? So you know you don't have to teach them anything outside of just uploading their art onto a into a into the blockchain. Mm. Yeah. What about? Um, I think one thing I'm interested to understand is how um, how much Web three is in the metaverse, and how much does the metaverse rely on Web three? I mean, the metaverse is still it's it's not even nascent. It's, it's still forming, and you know that one of the biggest things is that most of the Web3 companies right now rely a lot on Web2 technology. You know, it's a transition just like Web1 to Web2 was. There was a period between, I, I can't remember, was it like six, was it six degrees was the first social media? There was about 10 mm -hmm. years where social media was forming and user-generated content. Mm. And so everything is so early with the metaverse now. But if you look at, say, I mentioned the concerts there, we're already seeing, we're working on some concert augmentation where you go and you take your phone out at a concert and your avatar is doing a dance on the stage with the DJ and you can record that and share it. You know, it's, a, it's simple stuff where you're integrating augmented reality into a concert. Mm. So just slow transitions. And what about the ownership piece? So like, why does it matter that, that I can own a, a part of this world, that I can trade a part of this world? Well, I think when we recorded Feel Inside and stuff like that, it went viral, mm. and then we had to build this kind of this mechanism to try to get people to donate. We got three and a half million views on YouTube alone, and we had 45,000 donations, average donation $10. If in this new world, oh, you know, we did it in, in January this year, we held a 24-hour telephone with a Zoom call, and we raised $1.1 $1 .1 million using Web3, because people connect with the content, can com immediately buy the content, and almost all of the funds from that content goes towards the creator or the cause. Mm. So, you know, raising $1.1 $1 .1 million for Auckland City Mission, it was so funny. I mean, if you want to watch that on YouTube, it's amazing because you can watch these lovely ladies at Auckland City Mission who totally think that the whole thing is a con while we're raising them. And it just keeps <laughs> going up over 200,000, 400, 500,000. And they just, they have no idea what's happening. And at the end, we got $1.1 $1 .1 million for them. But it's just so easy if you... When I, when I showed you that video before of little Katie Archer, if there was just a single button that you could press there, donate, complete mm. and easy, everyone would do it, right? It's interesting, though, because it's probably still YouTube that, that gives you that audience, right? Or, or the ability to reach that many people. Yeah, that's right. So you still have... With, it's going to be very transitional. Mm. I mean, there is a reason why... Uh, Meta is charging at this because we're already seeing these social media platforms, these giant broadcast platforms, starting to fragment, fragment and break into small communities. I believe that Web3 will end up with, you'll have a whole bunch of different avatars in your wallet that represent communities you're a member of. They'll give you access to those communities. Um, you'll be rewarded for interacting, contributing to those communities. Um, 
but you won't, the, these giant broadcast social media platforms are dying and mm. are gonna continue to die. You heard it here first, Meta's dying. Not Meta's dying, Spencer, are you in the audience? Oh, sorry. Meta's not dying because, no, honest, and the truth is, Zuckerberg was smart enough to realize that this is a, this is a massive change that's happening. And they will, as an example, we're seeing chat groups in Facebook like explode because small targeted communities are growing and this broad broadcast community stuff is dying. I mean, TikTok is not a social media channel, guys. That's, that's another conversation. Oh, I love it's it. A, it's not, it's a, it's, a, it's a crowdsourced broadcast channel. Yeah. So something that also was raised earlier was about, you know, if you're, if you're trying to tackle um, a technology opportunity from a different community's perspective, mm -hmm. you can either try and participate in the old structures or you can build something alongside. Yep. So as you think about Futureverse and your mission, um, you might have to play nice to a certain extent with centralized yeah. Web2 technologies, or you could maybe just build completely new structures. How do you think about that? I've always been, regardless of what the industry, I've always been a big uh, fan of steer and sync. So in ter this is in terms of causes as well. So if you've got these large companies that are potentially causing you know, environmental harm, you've got two options, uh, or, or any kind of harm, you've got two options. You can either ignore them and try to take them out, it's quite a long process, it's kind of hit or miss, or you can steer them and sync them at the same time, right? So I would like to, you know, everyone that I've met in any of these large Titan tech companies, they're wonderful people. Mm. They're great people that have the same, they share the same outcomes, um, many of them, as, as we do. The difference is that they're just um, restricted by a pretty terrible, mo I mean, sh extracting shareholder value is a bit of a disaster in terms of some of like our ideal outcomes for businesses. Is it different for Futureverse? You don't, so the most important thing about Web3 is that, this is probably the exact wrong forum for this. Go because, on. Well, no, because VC will also adjust. But it can't, we can't just build businesses that only prioritize extracting shareholder value. That idea of you know, shareholders extracting values from an, value from an organizational participants, the, the workers, and they're extracting value from customers, you know, it's crazy. Well, not even customers, they call them users. The mm. only other industry that calls their clients users is the drug, <laughs> is the drug industry, right? <laughs> so this model is terrible. If you look at our community, 13,000 stakeholders that we have in our community, they are our only, their benefit is our only outcome. That's all we're looking for. How do we increase our community's ability to um, uh, obtain value from what we're doing? And so they are not just the shareholders, they are the, they're every stakeholder. They're the community, the user, the shareholder, et cetera. Yeah. Another question from the Slido. So um, how should we think about the, I guess, the environmental impact of what you're building? Yeah. Is the computational demand created by NFTs and blockchain technology sustainable? Um, can it's it be made good, more efficient? Question. So I mean, the first, the first, part about, first part about that is that, you know, this is, this is a core, transitional challenge that Web3 blockchain has gone through. And the merge is now less than a month away that you know, the, the second largest blockchain, Ethereum, is it's about been, to become. It's been less than a month away for quite a few months, I think, isn't it? Yeah, no, I think they're there. I've, everything okay. I'm reading is saying that they're, they're pretty much there now. So that's 98.98% more efficient. Um, we, we are working ourselves on technology that will make that even more efficient, and everything we've done has been 200% offset. And offset with Carbon Click, who are fantastic biodynamic, top of, top of the chain offset. But if we were to go into any technology and look at its environment footprint in its early in the early days, mm. we wouldn't have done any of this. YouTube wouldn't have happened. Netflix wouldn't have happened. None of this would have happened. Um, so the sense of looking at an ideal eventual outcome. And by the way, so this is my last bit on this rant. No one is measuring the environmental footprint of all of banking. You know, no one's measuring those buildings and all the staff. They're sitting there going, oh, yes, Ethereum, I transfer $100,000, it's going to cost this much on the... But you know what I'm saying. It's mm. not apples and apples. So For I sure. get really... Aaron McDonald does a better job of explaining that, <laughs> but that's pretty much done now. We'll stick with the mini rant, but I like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, how should we think about the metaverse yes. when we live in such a beautiful country with lovely, mostly clean air, yes. uh, waters, beaches, and so on. Um, is this the, f is in the metaverse future inevitable for us? Yeah, well, the first thing is, you know, so I'm, I'm someone that d uh, never grew up in gaming and immersive is fascinating. If you've been someone, I saw, oh, what was that quote? 
anyone that's dismissed, dismissed virtual reality has never tried it. That's the, <laughs> like someone. T- it is really impressive and interesting. I am also a believer that our job should be to augment this incredible world. Um, our goal needs to be saving places. There is no doubt that if we're able to visit, um, you know, tourism is an incredibly destructive force right now. Um, the ability to take what David Attenborough did mm. in the, you know, from the 40s onwards and bring these environments to us so that we can better empathise with them and connect with them. If you can take that and supercharge that, that's a truly incredibly powerful thing. It's not saying that, you know, the whale sharks of the Philippines are, uh, you know, are, are bad. Or, you know, we, we don't love them. In fact, it's saying we love them. We just don't need to go to the Philippines to enjoy how amazing they are. You could even relive your Atlanta Olympics closing ceremony skating performance. I could do. I, I went to YouTube to try to find it, but it's, it's not really there. I'm so old. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're not going to talk about ripple over Ethereum, I don't think, on this occasion. Oh, I'm not the wrong guy. I'm the wrong guy <laughs> to talk about anything like that and why we chose Ripple as our first partner but they have some amazing technology that's going to help. It's not Ripple over Ethereum. Mm. We're building a bridge between a number of blockchains, including Ethereum. Mm. The goal there is that you shouldn't know, as a user out there, you shouldn't know what blockchain is. It should just be seamless. You shouldn't know what blockchain you're on or that's which right. environment you're in. Hide the yeah. crypto. Yes. Hide the crypto. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's the key. Mm. If we are tribal about our blockchains and it's like winner take all for Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, or you know, Cardano, that's completely the wrong mindset. We need to build bridges and, bi- and build base functionality for everything. Bridges, not walls. Yeah, amen. Um, and why, what are, the, what are the kind of pros and cons of building Futureverse from New Zealand? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't a, it wasn't a choice because we, you know, we love this place so much, and, um, but we've been very lucky. The first thing is that there's been 30 years of investment into 3D animation. So we have these incredible animators that form the foundation. The second thing that's incredible, if anyone knows the story of centrality, I mentioned that we formed Non-Fungible Labs, which is now becoming Futureverse 18 months ago, but six years ago, Aaron McDonald started building this DeFi network um, centrality. What's DeFi? Uh, Decentralized finance. So blockchain network and decentralized finance network um, and for the last four years after he invested in me, people kept saying, oh, listen, they haven't done very much. They're not doing anything. And it was because the technology hadn't just really caught up. And it turns out that we are now probably three years ahead of the rest of the world in terms of a whole bunch of DeFi technology. And now that we've released the NFT layer, which is the storytelling layer on top of that, um, it's given us a significant advantage over the rest of the world. So as I mentioned, of those 250 um, team members that we've got, over 200 of them are in New Zealand. The rest are kind of based around the world. Yeah, it's amazing. I bet, yeah. bet not many people knew how many Futureverse folks sitting up on a, a slightly dodgy building in K Road, <laughs> that's building, right, that's building right. the metaverse uh, from, from New Zealand. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, something that keeps coming up in the questions and, and on my mind as well is what is going to be the thing that drives mass adoption of yeah. these technologies? What are the, what's the aha moment for? you know, my grandma um, or someone who's not literate in these technologies? It's, that's the really interesting question. And I don't, I'd love to p- pretend I have an answer for that. I mean, obviously the key thing is gonna be utility, mm. a sense of something being useful. I love the, um, the I used to, sorry, I'm embarrassing. I'm the person that says, ask Siri questions all the time. And I love the idea. She just I, never, she's not that helpful. That's the problem. Well, I, I think I was explaining to you. I had the, one of the Facebook team at Prego and asked, uh, asked it where the closest restaurant was and it delivered me like a restaurant about 150 meters away. But the sense of being able to own your own data exhaust and like then aim that at different functionality is just so awesome. And like be able to mold it. One of the things, um, David McDonald, who's just brilliant, Aaron's brother, and he has Altered State Machine, is trying to get across his teaching people how to use AI, teaching people how to use this technology, because if we're in a sort of a a wrestle between these Titan tech companies and you, you're gonna need to at least know the kind of the groundwork of this so that you know what your data, what's Mm. happening with your data, how to control it, how to own it, and how to at least monetize it a little bit. Mm. So I, I think that, I think, so as an example, I think that that avatar 
to assistant is a mass adoption tool. Yeah. Take the power back. Yeah. I mean, it's just incredible how... Yeah, I, I could go on about that for We could go on for yes, hours. Yes, I could. But we're out of time. Are we out of time? The time is flashing again. Oh, my God. It yep. was, that was really nerve-wracking. I couldn't tell if I was five minutes over or there's five <laughs> minutes to go. It's crazy. Okay. We can take a deep breath now. And we're going to seed the stage for the next story. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very, Thank you, very much. Oh.